If you're interested in startup societies and the Hoppian concept of private law, you'll want to meet our guest today, Dr. Titus Gebel. Uh, he's joining us from Monaco, where he now lives, originally from Germany, where he founded a mining company and was president and CEO of that. He's now president and CEO of FreePrivateCities.com. He'll be speaking this week at George Mason University on this very topic. So that said, Titus, first of all, tell us a little bit about pre Free Private Cities Incorporated, what, what the business model is and what you're trying to do. Yeah, uh, Jeff, thank you for introducing me. So uh, what a pre Free Private City actually is, is um, the idea that a private company uh, offers you the basic services of a state or a government, which is uh, the protection of life, liberty, and property. And we are doing this in a defined territory within a host nation. And the idea is that you pay, or every, every resident pays a certain amount for those services per year, but this will be a fixed amount. And your respective rights and obligations are laid down in a written agreement between you as a resident and the city provider, which is me. And apart from that, you're free to do as you choose. And the big difference is that suddenly you are a contracting party on an equal footing uh, with a secured legal position uh, instead of being subject to the ever-changing whims of politics. And, and of course, you only become part of it if you accept the offer. So what we are doing is basically we're transferring something that we are already know, which is behavior in the market, in the service market, to the market of living together, as I call it. And you got a real social contract with a written contract, and you can you can in advance have a look at okay, is this uh, do I like this way how they offer it, um, and if yes, um, I know what I have to pay per year, which will be much less obviously pr probably than you pay now in taxes, and uh, and then you can decide if you like the offer or not. If you like it, you come. If you don't like it, you stay where you are. What's interesting to me is is what what parts of the of the world do you think are more interested in, in serving as a host to this kind of things? The West seems to be jaded and and sadly in in some ways less interested in liberty than it once was. But other parts of the world are waking up and wanting greater wealth, greater prosperity for themselves. Do you, do you find a, a particular region that interests you primarily? Well, we we are basically open. I mean, it's indeed so that. Um, a wealthy country has not real incentives to right. try out such radical new things, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not so radical. It's basically a kind of a special economic zone or a special administrative zone. Um, and you can say maybe it's like the relationship Hong Kong China, right? You, the, the country would will still be uh, will will still remain sovereign and will be responsible for defense and foreign policy. But for the rest, we we are more or less autonomous. Well, there are already some attempts in the world, and they're all not in Western countries. They're like in Central America, where, um, yeah, there are countries that are interested, of course, because countries have problems, right? I mean, that's how the world works. Like, you have a problem, you think, okay, I should change something. And now I'm open to new ideas, whereas in, the, in Western Europe, uh, we have so many tax income. Why should we, right? Why should we? Try out new things, right? That is the that is the point. And in so far, to be realistic, we probably will end up in the first degree with countries that have some issues. But on the other hand, these are countries that are open enough to say, okay, let's try out new thing, and we are willing to give guarantees. Um, we are very close with one country in Central America. It's not completely finished, and so far, it's a little bit too early to announce. Now, this is the country, and there you go. But I would just invite interested parties to subscribe to my newsletter on the website, uh, freeprivatecities.com. And there you will be informed, hopefully, in the next two or three months. And then there are other countries like Puerto Rico. There's an interesting conference coming up in, in Washington on Wednesday and Thursday. And they are broke. And so they are open to new ideas. It's not decided if they will be open to the free private cities idea. At least they are willing to, to listen. And there's, there are other countries in, uh, in the world, like Georgia, they are trying to establish new uh, special economic zones. And they are also they, they approached me and said, we want to talk about your concept. So, um, well, you start, my idea is you start at the fridges and then come back to the developed world. And because they will, once we, we have proven that this concept works and that it's beneficial 
to all parties, to the residents, to the government, to the state, and also to us as a provider, then it's probably then easier to go to other countries or maybe even countries will approach us that are more developed. They say, okay, we, we have seen what you're doing and we want to give it a try. But I want to distinguish between what you're proposing and other startup society concepts. So what, what you're talking about is different than, than let's say, seasteading proposals or the Lieberland concept. You're not necessarily talking about creating a new nation. You're talking about creating a, a, a private city within an existing host nation. Yeah. So in that sense, you think it's more practical? Yeah. Look, here, the, the, the problem I see, I mean, I have good contacts to both Lieberland uh, and to the seasteaders, and I support both. Support both of them, because and, and, and many more. I mean, I think this is a market of living together. Mm-hmm. And as a libertarian, I think we should have more competition, right? <laughs> because it's then raising the quality of, of the products. And and so far, um, but you are right. I mean, it's it's much more difficult to go and say we're founding a new nation. And even the terra nullius concept where you claim that you have found a, a piece of land that is unclaimed, it's only unclaimed as long uh, as the the neighboring states doesn't decide the other way, right? And then suddenly it's a problem. And so definitely, I think this was were also the problems of the attempts in the past that they were basically going against existing states. That is something I think is not really the right way to do it. It has not much uh, chances of success. Um, so the better way is to go to something they already know, which is a special economic zone. And now you say, okay, we are special economic zone plus or next level. And you, we can also point on entities in, uh, in Dubai or Abu Dhabi that have implemented foreign law. So it's a, it's a legal system within a legal system. They've implemented common law from most British oriented common law within an Arab country. So it's already there. And we are just going one step further. And we are also willing to make compromises, right? In Central America, for example, where we are negotiating with the government, they said, okay, but we have certain areas of our constitution, they still must apply. And we have international agreements that we cannot give up. And we understand that completely, right? So if people now are listening to your show and, and are dreaming of a perfect world, I cannot offer that. Uh, maybe later, but <laughs> we have to make compromises in the beginning, mm-hmm. and it still will be much better because I, I mean, where do you have a contract where we can sue the government? And only you. There's no need for a parliament or or an institution to sue the government, but you can because you have a contract, and you say, I think, I feel that you government or administration, you have violated our contract. And now going to independent arbitration, because that's the mechanism we are offering, right? We are not offering our own courts. We are offering independent arbitration outside of the free private city. So that is a, is a more balanced approach. And that is already something I think we have many areas where we can prove new concepts that they are going to work because they're not so new. That's what you know, uh, know from the from the daily life, right? If you are... Uh, make a service agreement with with a, with a with a lawyer or a tax accountant. You know what you have to pay for what and what you are expected right. to get. And, right. and so it's not a utopian idea. It's just a well, we are we're transforming the already known market ideas to the living together model. So the incentive for the host company, the host country, is the opportunity for capital to come in to attract capital. In other words, that's why they would want to cooperate. Yeah, that's it's indeed it's like like imagine you have a you have an area where where before is nothing or very few activity and then you create in Monaco or Hong Kong there, mm-hmm. right? And even that's one one of my main arguments if, if when I discuss uh, with the state or government and I'm saying, look look at Singapore, look at Hong Kong, and look look at Monaco. All of those city states around those states. Within the in the other state is a big belt of wealth, and a lot of people are, are commuting. They are working there. A lot of companies from the from the surrounding states are getting um or basically demand from within there. And if there before was nothing, and suddenly there's such a wealthy place, it's a win-win situation. And here's another thing where we are different to the other approaches. We are there for profit, right? A lot of people say, ah. Oh, that is not unethical or something like that. No, no, we, here's the thing. It's 
two things. One, what, what is the big advantage of, of doing it for profit? One is we have to take care that our custom, we are treating our customers well because otherwise they don't come and we don't make money. So we have a real incentive to treat them well. The other thing is we have to be very uh, wisely uh, with our resources. So we, we cannot waste resources because it's all for, we want to save the world and all that. No, no. And, and so we have two incentives that are extremely strong to create something that is sustainable and that is working and that is attractive to everybody. And, and that is always often lacking if only idealists coming together and say, let's do something there. It's, I mean, you know, two people, three opinions. I mean, I've, I've seen this several times, especially in this area. And so you need a more, you need really a, a pushy a business model. Saying, okay, you want to make money and this is the concept. And of course, we have, all, we, we have to adapt our concept if we see that it's not working or people do not right. accept it. Right. But what, what you're talking about is forget all the big picture libertarian theory. When you get down to sort of nitty gritty daily life in a city and, and, and so-called services that a city provides, what you're talking about is really upending the model because cities and localities don't have market discipline. In, in how they provide services, whereas a, a exactly. private city could. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, Sandy Springs is a, a super example where Oliver Porter has introduced market thinking into communal services, and it fantastically worked. And I'm proud to say that Oliver is one of my advisors because we want to learn from him. But so it's not against being the the overall ideas and and um, um, basically philosophy. It's just. At the end of the day, it's do you have an attractive product, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe, uh, I think Joe Kirk from, from Seasteading, he, he, he put it down. He said he nailed it down. I said, 50 years from now, probably the most uh, successful so societies will not subscribe to any of today's ideologies. And that is what, what, what the market as a discovery process is. is I want to, to uh, basically initiate that. I say, okay, we have libertarian, classical, liberal ideas. And I stick to that idea. And if we are right, our product must be a success. But if it's not, well, maybe we are not so right. Or maybe it's only what I think, Jeff, is that people are different. And some people will prefer other models to other people. And so it, there is probably not one, one model fits all, even if it's a super libertarian model. Some people probably want more guidance. They want more mm -hmm. welfare, whatever. They have to pay more for that. Sure. That's the deal, right? <laughs> or to give up some freedom. That's the deal. And so we are starting with a, with a classical liberal model, protection for life, liberty, and property for all the rest you're on your own. But then we will see what's going to happen. We will probably offer also an anarcho-capitalist model which is even less state and one model which right. is a little bit more state, right. <laughs> right? And there's no more need to argue between anarchists and minarchists and, and statists. Let the market decide, right? But we could really upend the whole concept of government if, if people were truly mobile and governments had to compete for constituencies, yeah. if people could leave. Uh, talk, about, seen, talk about talk yeah. about the issue of passports. That seems like a thorny issue yeah. in in this in the, in the in the notion of a private city that exists within yeah. a larger sovereign country. Yeah. Well, look, it, it, it's at the beginning. It, I would say it's even an advantage. I mean, we can we are not a sovereign entity. We cannot give our own passports. So everybody keeps their own passport, right? They come from all kind of areas. I mean, immigration is something we have to deal with the with the host nation. But we say, okay, we want to attract people from all over the world, but we want also to select people. We don't want political or religious extremists or criminals, right? So we refuse them. But for all the rest, we would like to attract people from all over the world. So we agree on an immigration procedure with the, uh, with the host nation. That is already happening, for example, in the Central American example. It's not a problem. And then we, we can say, if you break the contract, for example, you do not pay your annual fee or you become a criminal, we kick you out. We, we cancel the contract. And then the pe person can go back where they were coming from. So that is that is something that is uh, for us a little bit easier in the beginning. Over time, probably something like uh, citizenship develops. Mm -hmm. And then you have to, 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 to change the policy and say, okay, 
what we are doing with our criminals now, right? So we have to put them in prison or whatever. So um, I think in the beginning, it's not a problem at all. You you just, you have, a uh, like in Monaco, right? You have a residence card, but 80% of the people there are not Monaco citizen. So um, you have an entitlement to be there in the city. Not everybody has, but you have your city card, your residence card, and you have your passport from whatever country. So in 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 the, in the real world, it's not a big issue. It's like you living in Dubai or mm-hmm. Singapore with your U.S. passport. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned Singapore, you mentioned Dubai, you mentioned Monaco, uh, uh, Hong Kong. So we have some existing models. Are there any models in history? You know, we look back at European history. There were city states like Venice. Yeah. Uh, there were free ports. Uh, places where very very low tax zones, so it's not something that 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 doesn't have historical precedent. Excellent, yeah, in, indeed. I mean, that is that is also basically a good sign, right? <laughs> that uh, the people from from Venice, for example, they they uh, escaped uh, war and could better defend the lagoon, and there they developed their own city in the in the Middle Ages, especially in in Germany in Germany in Central Europe. You had those independent cities that were sick of their princes and their archbishops. They said, we we want to be, well, what the deal was, we are directly under the emperor. But the emperor was 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 basically powerless at that time. So they were independent. And, uh, and that worked over a long time. And they even formed the Hanseatic League, uh, which was a strange system because all these cities were still part of, uh, of empires and 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 countries, but at the same time, they were part of the Hanseatic League, which right. was by themselves a very powerful um, uh, association. They even could fight the big powers of their times, which was Denmark, for example. So, um, indeed, we have some uh, precedents in history, and I think the, the new one, what we have here, is that that's, it's on a, on, a, on a private free market basis with a contract, but the overall idea is not so much different from the people in the ancient times, in the Greek city states, Venice, the Italians, or the, or the German uh, imperial free cities, that is all the same. We want to govern ourselves according to our rules, and and we want to do it the, the way we like it, right? And that's exactly basically what we are offering. But we are offering it on a for-profit basis to avoid the problems that all those city cities became over time, that they had a parliament and a majority, which eventually was hijacked by wealthy families or the mayor or people who want to expropriate uh, others. And, and here you're protected by the, by the contract and uh, city, the people are free to form their own councils. But even if 99% say we have a council and we subscribe to the council's decision, the 1% who says no, I I'm stick to the contract with the city provider. I don't want to have anything to do with your council. They are left alone. And that is the difference to anything we had before. So there is something new and something old. Do you have any thoughts on the, the Swiss model of subsidiarity and, and pushing decision-making down to the local level and, uh, and decentralization generally? Yeah, I think this is one of the big results for success of Switzerland. It's not only direct democracy, it's especially the fact that they are so decentralized. So the, the community, they can decide a lot. And then above, it's the, the canton. And only then it's a federal level. And there's not much remaining at the federal level, right? Which is uh, exactly the opposite of what happened in Germany, which, which also is a traditionally federal country. But the, even after World War II, since then, the power went more and more to the central, right, to the central government. And basically, communities and cities have not much power. The, the federal states still have some some uh, meaningful power, but the community is basically zero. And that is something which is not, not, not correct. And that's one of the reasons why it's not working that well. Look, if we have some entities like free private city or comparable special zones, that uh, this alone would put some compet- yeah. competitive pressure on the states, even if it's only a handful, right? Because then people would say, they have a contract. I want a contract for my government too, right? So uh, things like that, right? It's, so I think competition e- even works if it's only a few examples in the world. 
Well, it's amazing, isn't it, how almost every aspect of human life is becoming more and more decentralized except governance. That's yeah. the only part of life where things, things that used to be local become national, things that used to be national become supranational. So I think the idea of competition is absolutely critical here. So Dr. Titus Gelbel, your website is freeprivatecities.com. You'll be in the U.S. this week, I believe, speaking at a conference. Yes, I will be uh, this week, Wednesday and Thursday, on the uh, uh, Startup Societies Foundation Conference in Washington, where it's about uh, creating new ideas for Puerto Rico to become uh, successful again. So make Puerto, Puerto Rico great again with new ideas of living together. And uh, I'm, I will uh, hold a speech there, and I invite everybody to, to join the conference. It's just George Mason University, together with the Startup Societies Foundation, and if you're interested in maybe becoming a resident of a free private city, I would invite you to subscribe to my newsletter. You can find it through the website. And it's not coming often every two or three months, but if something is happening, you will, you will be informed by the newsletter. Well, excellent. Titus, thank you so much for your time. It's great meeting you. Thank you, Jeff. My pleasure.